as well as parents. Recording in progress, thanks, Jean. Um, as well as um, parents, specifically parents from wards seven and eight, we wanted to hear from, and we also did a group with Spanish speaking parents. So I'll try to highlight um, some of what we heard from them as well. Um, reviewers are from different agencies as well as um, our community advisors. And so we did get a lot of feedback from PAVE, which we are greatly appreciated. Julie, I don't want to interrupt you. I think the slides yeah, are please. off a little bit on the right. I don't know oh. if there are people. If there's a different way to share, if not, the majority of the content is there. <laughs> Just wanted to. Does fly. this fix it or no? Okay. okay. Yeah. Thanks, Chelsea. And great job interrupting. I I do appreciate the interaction. So feel free. Anyone can jump in. Um, so we'll start with a look at enrollment um, from the last year. So there were projections that enrollment was supposed to increase by about. 4,000 students in the last school year, but it ended up increasing by only 17 students. So quite different than what we expected. Um, you can see these differences um, largely in pre-K, there was a huge decline. There were 7% fewer students enrolled in pre-K than in previous school years. Um, a large percentage of these drops were in wards seven and eight. Um, and it definitely has implications for how students will enter kindergarten, but also just enrollment down the line. Like, will we have the same number of students in elementary school and middle school as um, years progress? So something to keep an eye on for different budget considerations. Um, by student group, 45% of students were designated as at risk, um, which is an increase of two percentage points from the previous school year. And I'll just make a note that we do use um, students designated as, as at risk throughout the report and it's a funding category. So it includes students who receive SNAP or TANF or other public benefits. Um, it includes students who are in the foster care system as well as students who are over age in high school. So we're not saying anything about these students specifically, it's just the funding category and that is how it's um, the language. So I know it's an imperfect category, um, but it is one that is used often in different um, budget and policy conversations. Um, as far as students with disabilities, 16% of students um, were classified as students with disabilities, which is similar to previous years, and 12% of students um, were English learners, which is also similar to previous years. And if any of these graphs, if you want me to go back to any of them at any time, just let me know. Um, so in our report, we also talk a lot about school environment. And so this can be anything that comes into play in affecting students day to day. Um, as you all remember, um, school started at the beginning of the school year, 99% of students were online. And I know it's, it's always hard for me to kind of put myself back in the mindset of August before that year, um, but that wasn't the plan to be virtual, right? So it was a quick pivot to virtual learning um, and it was difficult for a lot of folks. So by the end of the school year, you can see on this graph that so more students went back to in-person um, by the end of the school year. Oh, our graph got a little chopped off, but it's 21% um, were back to in-person. Now this wasn't back to in-person full-time. This just meant that students had at least one day of in-person learning a week. Um, it was more common for younger students. So the K through two and pre-K students to be, to have some in-person learning. Um, and it was also more common for white students to have more in-person learning and for um, students from more affluent parts of the city. So by the end of the school year, 79% of the students were still learning completely from home. And this of course introduced challenges in terms of accessing computers and devices. Um, and while we found that device distribution was pretty good this year, um, much better than in the previous school year, um, there were more issues with internet quality and device quality. So students you know, had internet, but maybe it was too laggy to join a video call. Um, and this survey from Empower K-12 found that 46% of students said that their internet was always good enough to participate fully in school activities. Um, and we saw similar information from parents and teachers. Um, additionally, this um, from a State Board of Education survey of teachers in the district, 17% of teachers said that they had all the supports they needed for virtual learning. Um, 
So while schools, you know, really worked hard to make this pivot and to provide um, resources for all kinds of folks, um, there were still gaps in how people accessed them. So specifically for parents and families, um, is this page of data broken down by ward? Um, the in-person learning, I believe we have that. Um, I'm gonna let Chelsea answer the questions in the chat. Um, I think she has a good handle on it. So um, we do have it by student group, yeah. And if we have time at the end, we can always pull that up as well, but it is in the report as well. Um, so specifically for parents and families, um, this is this information is from oops, excuse me from a survey um, conducted by the DC Policy Center that looked at satisfaction levels for um, in different aspects um, before, during, and um, not after the pandemic, but before and during. So as you can see, pre-pandemic um, from pre-pandemic to spring 2020. Satisfaction dropped in pretty much all of these metrics. I think all of these metrics. Um, and it rebounded for some in fall 2020. Um, two areas where we did not see the same level of rebound was the opportunities for your children to participate in schools, in sports or extracurriculars, as well as quality of the facilities. So I don't have like exact reasons why these didn't rebound as much, but it has probably due to something with um, you know, having access to the facilities and the different ways that things were shut down. Um, we also include a lot about parent satisfaction levels. And so this is something we heard in our focus groups with parents that managing children's education at home was just extremely challenging, especially having to balance work responsibilities, um, having to make sure that your child is set up on the computer, and especially for younger children who can't you know, set themselves up on the computer it's extra challenging. So um, this data is from the PAVE survey from spring 2021 that mentioned that 39% of parents mentioned um, managing children's education at home was a top challenge. Um, but PAVE also released that in fall 2021, this number dropped to 16%. So um, possibly because you know students were in school, um, were in school and they didn't have to manage this type of um, education from home as well, so possibly, you know, other reasons as well. And we'll, we can have um, time to discuss that in, in a few minutes. Um, specifically in our Spanish speaking focus group, um, parents who are Spanish speaking shared that they encountered different language barriers and challenges when they were advocating for their children with individualized education plans or IEPs or for English, learn, English language services. So while this is something that came up in all of our focus groups with parents, you know, they weren't always sure um, if their students were receiving the right resources um, or that maybe communication was a little bit murky. This specifically came out as something that a lot of parents had some um, engaged with during that focus group. And overall communication and engagement was um, a big issue for families that we heard. Um, it was identified in over half of the Office of the Ombudsman cases. Um, while it wasn't necessarily the main issue in all of these cases, it was usually something that um, confounded other cases. So um, maybe amplified concerns and made it more difficult to um, learn about what was going on or resolve issues. So now we would love to hear from you all about your experience. Um, so I'll go ahead and launch this poll. Um, if you don't mind answering, or if you'd rather put things in the chat, um, but compared to fall 2021, how is everyone doing and how would you describe um, managing your children's education? Is it more difficult, um, a similar level of difficulty or less difficult? We'll give that a minute. Great, I think we got most folks up. Give you another moment. And then while you're filling that out, if you think um, maybe we could pause to have some discussion here um, about how are these challenges different um, 
maybe based in the, like the severity of the problem, or maybe there are different kind of challenges. Um, and if you'd like to put that in the chat, or if you're um, a hand raiser, or however you feel compelled to share. I'll go ahead and end the poll. Yeah, um, Keisha. And if I mispronounce anyone's name, please, um, if you're comfortable, please uh, correct me. Yeah, that, that's correct. So yeah, I, I responded to the poll, um, but also into this question, I think it's less difficult. And I think um, because they're back in person, I feel like I have a little bit more access to their, her teachers um, mm. and instruction. I feel like the teachers are maybe a little bit less overwhelmed as where they were in the previous year. And so their response time is a lot more efficient um, there's a lot more information. And I think the combination of having done this for a while, that they're just better at it. Like we're all better at it. Um, mm. So it's not as challenging as it was in 2021. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much. That's definitely, I don't think necessarily we didn't include teachers in this specific slideshow, um, but that is something in the report that you know we heard a lot about how overwhelmed they were as well. So yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, yeah, Elizabeth. Hi, um, I think it really depends on the person and their support level. For me, um, and one of my children that has an IEP, I feel like it's more difficult, um, specifically because there was a lot of changes in staff. Actually, my daughter that has a 504, it was changes in staff. So virtually, I feel like they were providing services um more like executive functioning services because we were online and then when they went back to school like nobody knows who's supposed to be supporting her because she doesn't have a one-on-one -on -one, um but she is like supposed to check in with an adult every week to see about her scheduling and here we are in January and it still hasn't happened so like it's just things just little nuances like that and um I also my son that um has autism I find that it's because the schools are so short staff, it's very difficult to, you know, help him get his breaks that he's supposed to get, you know, in his IEP. Um, it's just literally there's not staff available to take him to do those things. Mm, that's really interesting. That's also something, um, I'm not sure if I included this quote from one of our focus groups, but that um, also with virtual, that was challenging too, because students, with the different platforms couldn't necessarily be like pulled into another another space or get that one-on-one -on -one support um, but that's interesting with the staffing how that compounds it too um, i think uh yolanda if you'd like to share uh yes thank you um so i chose a similar level of difficulty um much like um elizabeth shared my son has autism and he's in high school um so like once the pandemic hit we didn't have that opportunity as he was trying to transition it from middle school to high school for him to get acclimated with the staff and you know try to find a space before um school got started and so now that we are in person it's been you know i'd say quite difficult but to be quite honest since we you know been dealing with trying to advocate in the space for him and um, special education it's always been difficult um so i mean i feel like that even though they're in person because of the stress on the teachers and everybody's still trying to make sense of it you know you know me in 2022 that um my son has regressed in areas where you know he was really getting gains in um by these things not being um accessible and uh so it's, it's kind of stressing me out <laughs> a lot more than uh norm if if that makes any sense because it didn't when i said it on my mouth but um yeah so i i just hmm. i'm in the space of trying to still figure it out in this 2022 and he's only going further and further into his high school experience so not good for the nerves at all <laughs> hmm. yeah thank you so much for sharing that um i think it's great to to recognize that even going back in person it didn't like release any of these challenges necessarily like they're still still working through them um Neela yeah um I put down that it things have become less less difficult and I think that's for two reasons my child had a lot of uh, mental health challenges during the pandemic um a lot of severe behavior difficulties that I think were just 
triggered by the lack of normalcy in his situation and the lack of stability. And um, since getting back to school, I would say the first few weeks were still a little bit rough because that was another change as well. He also switched schools. But since then, he's completely gotten into the routine. He feels very supported at school. And he's just a child for whom being in person works. He also was behind last year academically, but clearly capable, but just falling behind. And I mean, he's little, he's in second grade. So, um, you know, how much to make of that at that age is hard to say. But this year, he's been really inspired by some of his classmates who he sees, you know, reading chapter books. So he wants to read chapter books. And so I'm just finding that for him, being in this in-person environment where um, where he can be inspired by his classmates and, and feel that sense of community is incredibly helpful. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's hear from Letitia and then I think um, I'll share the poll results. Um, I was just gonna say similar level of difficulty. Um, and I think that's because there's no access to the teachers in terms of in-person. I think that is huge for a lot of people who were already engaged throughout earlier school years, especially if they want to manage specific um, details or, into, uh, or components of their child learning. I'm very fortunate that my children have done well consistently even during COVID, but as a parent, I feel like I'm more out of the loop now than I was during COVID because at least during virtual learning, I was present. I could try, if I see my son or my daughter struggling with some concept or having questions or having issues, I can jump into the chat, I can, you know, put, unmute myself and, you know, jump into the classroom if necessary, as if it was in person per se. Uh, but now I really don't have that access. I have Remind, I might have email, I might even have text messages and things like that. But if they're in class throughout the day, they're not really available. And then I literally just got a Remind today from like two weeks ago, um, that I was asking to have a meeting with my, you know, about my children's progress, because I just don't know until they bring home a report card, or I look on um, Dean's list for their grades, like I just don't know. And so even issues with like attendance and things like that, I have to do this email back and forth. And it's just very cumbersome, versus being able to have a conversation with someone. And there's not like a Zoom that I can jump into, or there's not like a breakout session that we can jump into, or even before doing um, COVID, we had opportunities where like during their lunch break or during their break throughout the day because they had breaks because of, you know, virtual learning, staring at the screen, we could jump in and with a teacher conference or they'll schedule a call during that time. And now it's just like non-existent. And so although the kids are in person and they may be liking the experience better, I just feel like as a parent, I'm left out more. And it's, mm -hmm. I'm, kind of like at the will of the, the, the teachers and the staff to send notifications or to send weekly newsletters as they said they would, or just comply to whatever they said they were gonna do in terms of communication. And it's not easy because nothing is really kept up to date in terms of their uh, social media pages, their websites, their, <laughs> their, their next steps. I don't know what they're doing in class or what the next step is in class. Like a lot of it is just really a guessing game and I just I'm grateful that they're doing well but I just feel like as a parent I'm completely absent of the process. Mm. That's such an interesting point I think um, it came up a lot in focus groups and also different things that we've been reading this last year that um, the communication for many did improve um, because everyone was on the same platforms or people were kind of experimenting with different ways to connect um, so you could have these like Zoom conferences and different check-ins that way. Um, and I, I think it's, um, we, we highlight on the report some bright spots and different communication methods is definitely one that um, it would be great to see that schools had like learn and incorporate those things as well. Um, I think we'll go to Olivia and then I'm gonna uh, move us on, but we can keep sharing about this topic as well. Hi, everybody. It's it's, it's, I think for us, it's, it's easier, it's better. Um, but I think one of the reasons is there is a huge age gap in my home. I'm a grandmother raising a grandchild. And so just for the two of us to be confined to
Oh. Yeah, he's been able to get back in school. He's in a small, the other part of this is he's in a small middle school. Hardy is really one of the best kept secrets in Washington, D.C. And I'm, I'm going to shout to the world that if you can get your middle schooler in Hardy, I feel like you will be well pleased. It's, it's like a family. And so the family has embraced us um, and really kind of ironed out the challenges. He too, my, my grandson too has an IEP, but believe it or not, this particular year has been his best year in school ever. Now, he also plays sports for the school. Now, I'm sure that that has done a lot for his social emotional development. Um, so I'm, I'm a, I, I joke all the time. I say, you know, God really has a sense of humor because I'm a senior citizen raising an adolescent and somewhere along the line, there is no chemical equation for that. So uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be involved, to be with you guys this afternoon. And I look forward to, uh, I think it's Saturday where we'll all be together in person. Okay, thank you. Thanks, yeah, that's really exciting. And I'm glad that um, going back has been so positive. And also I, I promise not to tell everyone about your best kept secret. <laughs> oh, tell them, tell them. I want the parent, you know, I'm one of these parents. If it's good for me, it might be better for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll go ahead and share the results. I think it um, kind of reflects uh, the conversation that we had for some, you know, it's more difficult. And of course, this is like a very simplistic question. So it doesn't really show degrees of difficulty, um, but just that it's different for, for so many different folks. Um, so I'll go ahead and go move on. Sorry, I have like four windows open. So we'll talk a little bit about student outcomes. Um, and just want to reiterate, this isn't a reflection on, you know, specific students and how well they did, but more about the system and how well it served them. Um, so overall, um, in our report, we talk a lot about how different student groups experience disproportionate impacts from the pandemic. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on each of these. Um, so we talk about chronic absenteeism, um, reading on grade level for kindergarten through grade two students, as well as the four-year graduation rate. And I think I have more detail about all of this, but um, we can come back to this slide when we're discussing as well. So first, um, attendance. As I'm sure you all know, if you were, you know, watching behind your kid's shoulder while they were in class, attendance was taken in a variety of different ways and meant a lot of different things this last school year. Um, but even still, um, recorded attendance was about 89.5%. Um, and 31% of students were chronically absent. So this means that they missed 10% or more of the school year. Um, so, you know, we can think about what that might mean just because it's been such a, it was such a weird school year. Um, but that um, chronic absenteeism is commonly um, related to other student outcomes. Um, but you can see that high school students were more likely to be chronically absent. They had much higher rates than um, their other peers and students designated as at risk also tended to have higher levels of chronic absenteeism. Um, so for learning outcomes for elementary and middle school students, and I should just say about attendance that we're kind of using that as a proxy for engagement levels. So whether that's engagement that um, how, how well the students engaged or how well the schools engaged them. Um, so looking at learning outcomes for this last year was a little complicated. Um, for the five years before the pandemic, DC had been improving on lear learning outcomes on the park state assessment. Um, but of course, last school year, there was no park state assessment. So it's a little bit challenging to get um, those comparison figures. We did look at an analysis by Empower K-12 that looked at learning outcomes. And it found that um, there, were, there was like high levels of unfinished learning. So fewer early elementary students um, who were in kindergarten through grade two were reading on grade level compared to previous school years. And there was also um, declines in achievement in English language arts, as well as in math. Um, 
We have more details about this in the report as well, if you're interested in specific levels um, for specific student groups. But overall, um, students designated as at risk also had um, lower achievement levels in these areas. Um, finally, we look at some learning outcomes for high school students. Um, so high school students, it's a little bit difficult to assess. Um, and there were like mixed, mixed results there. So we found 18% of students met the SAT college and career ready benchmark, which is similar to previous years. Um, we also found that the same number of students, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll take some water. 39% um, of students passed their AP IB exams, um, but that participation was lower overall by about four percentage points. And this was lower for English learners as well as um, Latino students. We also though found that the four-year graduation rate increased um, pretty much across the board for all student groups, um, which is great. Uh, and it may show different ways that students were engaging. There were also different graduation requirements. So students didn't have to complete the um, 100 hours of community service, they don't, also didn't have as strict requirements for how many classroom hours they had to have. Um, however, we did see that post-secondary enrollment um, declined. So this is what this graph is showing us. Um, across the board, um, fewer students were enrolled in post-secondary six months after graduation. And this is pretty consistent with what you see nationally. Um, if you've been kind of keyed in on this, like a lot of students are, are making other choices about what to do after high school right now. Maybe they were waiting for, you know, in person before enrolling in college. Maybe they're going into the workforce because there's so many jobs right now. Um, we're not really sure what students end up doing in DC. Um, we'll have a little plug for one of our previous reports where we go into great detail about all the things we don't know about students after they leave high school and how helpful that information might be. I'll put Chelsea on the spot. Maybe she can link it um, if you're interested in that. Um, oh, so this is the quote I was talking about. Um, we also wanted to highlight learning outcomes for students with disabilities and English learners. Um, as I mentioned, the Empower K-12 analysis suggested that there was more unfinished learning for these two different groups. Um, we also looked at the Office of the Student Advocate, which reported that special education concerns were the source of 24% of the calls that they received. Um, so families um, who were trying to receive those special education services definitely had some additional challenges that they had to navigate. Um, from the State Board of Education survey of teachers, 63% of teachers said that English learners were receiving the supports that they needed. So kind of on the converse of that um, means like a lot of teachers weren't saying that English learners were receiving those supports. So there were likely a disconnect between um, who needed support and who was receiving it. And as um, a few of you all have already mentioned, um, student mental health was a huge concern. And I know this is something that PAVE is really concentrating on, um, which I'm so excited about because during our focus groups and in everything that we read, um, this is just a huge issue that needs so much attention. Um, so first, the State Board of Education um, Student Advisory Council released um, their recommendations that stated that mental health was a concern for a lot of students. You know, I don't really need to list the reasons. I'm sure you all have firsthand experience. Um, in our report, we also highlight some practices that schools and LEAs implemented, um, for example, hiring additional staff, um, implementing different trainings. I think the statistic is at um, 16 of the 55 LEAs, they had um, social emotional learning training for teachers. And, um, you know, I think as some of these quotes say, um, we learned, we heard from an adult learner who was talking about the different services like yoga or like a support group that was being provided. Um, but we also heard a lot from students who were saying that their mental health just wasn't in a good place at all. Um, also in the report, we talk about the impact of violent crime and how that can really increase anxiety and stress for students, teachers, and families, um, and how that can impact how well a student can engage or, um, you know, learn because they have other things that they're worried about. 
Um, so I think that's a quote from a parent that we heard that, you know, sometimes students didn't want to leave the house. They were, they were too anxious to leave the house because of fears of um, safety. So I thought we would pause and let me see if I can put up another poll. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, and just was wondering, this is something that came up um, in previous PAVE surveys, but um, how aware are you of resources at your children's school that address mental health? Um, I think this is something that we that we like encountered a lot with the report that um, that there was a mix <laughs> um, before I, you know, bias any of your responses, whatever your experience is, is, is completely true. Yeah, so we'll give it another minute. Um, All right, two more seconds. Yeah, so you can see um, this is actually very similar to um, what we saw in different PAVE surveys. I believe, um, I'm not sure if it was the fall or the spring one, that 54% uh, of parents said like, yes, I am aware of these resources, but 40% said, 40 or about there said, you know, I'm not actually sure which I think is pretty telling that, um, that there are all these resources that we're pushing and funding, but if people aren't aware of them, then they might have difficulty accessing them. Um, and then let's talk about um, available resources. So I think I had this more in my mind as maybe we can make it academic or social growth. Um, And feel free to put other if you, you're like, this is too simplistic to say yes or no. Because um, I'd also like to spend some time thinking about um, hearing from you all about like, I know this is a huge PAVE priority. So just thinking about last year and how this year is maybe different, um, what changes would you like to see implemented during this school year or beyond? Um, and just what other changes in general would you like to see implemented? Um, I can share something. Um, hi, my name is Zani. Um, I have two daughters that go to Nall Elementary, they're in third grade. Um, so I am concerned just sometimes about the stories that my children bring home about the issues that other students in their classroom are facing, um, whether it's at home, how it's coming out, in the classroom between them and, and other students. Um, so some concerns about bullying. And I understand that resources, that everything is very strapped right now, but I really do believe that the teachers in the classroom, they need more support when it comes to supporting children that have more needs. Um, and then also what that looks like um, with the rest of the children, um, because you know, it doesn't matter so much what, what I have going on. If, if what's going on with other students in the classroom if they're having difficulties, it filters down to us as well. So just really supporting the teachers on the schools with that, with getting more mental health professionals or in-class support um, to guide children that need more one-on-one -on -one support at different times of the day. Hmm. That's, that's really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that's also something we heard a lot. Um, I'm thinking specifically of teachers, but I'm sure the students would also share that um, it's not just about what happens to them, right? It's like what happens in their classroom or um, the different things that they see like through the Zoom screen and how they um, you know, don't necessarily have those supports to, to deal with those things. Um, yeah, feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to share um, and tell my, it's not a fun fact, but I was hearing um, more about bullying. There's a lot of fears that you know, cyberbullying would be an issue. And at least one study found that, you know, it wasn't as much cyberbullying, but now that everyone's back in the classroom and they're not used to being around other students, like now we're having more 
um, concerns around that. Yeah, Deshaun, if you'd like to share. So, um, I mean, at, in short, and this has always been my issue, um, my, my children uh, have not been diagnosed with any disabilities or, or need any special attention. Um, however, as a parent, um, I do see that, uh, and, and, and this is, I'm on my soapbox, and, and I'm gonna keep it short, but I do see that, um, you know, basically our tier one supports are, are, are sorely lacking. Um, we have a greater number of students in the school um, that are not diagnosed um, and or um, have any disabilities that, that are, are recognized and they go, truly they go unattended to mainly because it, it's not prioritized um, by the school to focus on them and the resources that are available. Um, I am going to say they are there, but they are, it, it's at a minimum because there is such a great number of the students that um, just in my own personal experience, I get phone calls from teachers, um, which I'm very thankful for about what my child is doing in school. Um, and uh, I have utilized the, the mental health supports um, at the school to receive as much support as possible but it isn't prioritized mainly because my children do not have, they're, they're not documented as needing um, immediate services. And with that being said, um, a lot of our teachers who may need the supports in classrooms for the students um, who need one-on-one -on -one attention, but our teachers definitely need to be able to identify the resources for the students um, to help them along the way, especially with a lot of their um, uh, emotional intelligence and how they need to understand their movement beyond high school. And I'm gonna cut it short at that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I think um, you brought up many great points. Um, one that I'd like to highlight, you know, we don't actually, we couldn't find a lot of data about how students are being identified um, for, you know, evaluation if they need additional um, supports. And so while the number of students with um, disabilities hasn't changed over the year, it's, it's not clear if that's, you know, how students are being identified in those ways. So thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, and there's a lot of great stuff in the chat as well um, about how we need to normalize, you know, mental health conversations um, and, you know, reduce stigma about, see about like seeking out those, those assistance. So I really appreciate all those as well. Um, and they keep moving us through, although, you know, all of our questions kind of have to do with looking forward. So um, feel free to bring anything about this up. Um, see, we're you know nearing the end of our time, so I want to make sure we get to a, all of our information. Um, so looking ahead, um, the report closes. Um, you know, as we kind of exit this time of crisis, um, let's start planning not just for six months or what the next school year could look like, but maybe even looking five to 10 years, like what kinds of things do we want to really concentrate on for recovery? Um, so of course in the fall, we returned to school with full-time in-person learning um, with different COVID-19 health measures in place. This might feel like a million years ago at this point, but I don't know if anyone remembers back in fall, you know, different concerns about how we were approaching quarantine. Um, we have some statistics here about how many DCPS students were in quarantine as well as teachers. Um, this is only DCPS because um, we don't have that information for charters, but they were also experiencing quarantines as well. Um, and of course, this week, we also are experiencing a big change with changes to the mask mandate. So of course, this has been a very um, tumultuous year for us all. Um, 
And so the end of our report, we um, proposed tracking recovery um, for three different student group areas, or three different areas um, and disaggregating this by different student groups so we can ensure that you know progress and recovery is in an equitable way. Um, the first is student success. So that would be looking at chronic absenteeism, different achievement levels for academics, as well as transition to college. Um, and so those we all do already have that information, but just reporting it in a, in a standardized way. Um, we don't know a lot about credential earnings and um, transitions to college and career. Um, we also propose tracking some different metrics in student supports, like the number of mental health professionals, um, different well-being measures, um, exits from English learner status, goal attainment for students with disabilities, as well as teacher retention and satisfaction. Um, and lastly, we think it's really important to talk about perceptions of community safety. So uh, different community factors um, that are so important in the school. So perceptions of community safety, um, the amount of in-person or live instruction, as well as parent and caregiver satisfaction rates um, as reflected by both maybe survey information um, as well as enrollment levels. Um, so now we're really, really interested, I don't have a poll here, so please feel free to put things in the chat or you all have been great about um, unmuting yourself or raising your hand, but um, what areas or interventions do you think are most important to focus on for recovery and moving forward? Yeah, Letitia. Letitia. I think I would just harp on communication a lot because I feel like as a parent, I can be more um, engaged and more responsive when I know what's happening, what's going on. And I know my children aren't uh, very vocal when it comes to expressing what their day was like, what happened, what comprised of that day and so forth. And so because of that, a lot of times it's like a guessing game where I got to ask 50 million questions to really pull out from them what is happening and what is going on. And again, although it may not be academic, I do understand that they're going through their parents being divorced. And that's huge. It's a big life change. And going back and forth between homes, I'm sure impacts them as a person individually. And then they're dealing with those emotions and then trying to deal with park and trying to deal with you know, social situations. I know my daughter has even mentioned to me about um, how even though he's she's been in school with these kids from pre-K three, now that she's in her second year of middle school, she's noticing that people are starting to form cliques and she's not a part of certain cliques and how that affects her. And she's, you know, she understands that maybe they're not the right crowd for her, but at the same time, I feel like there's something there in terms of understanding like to value self and to understand that not everybody's going to be your friend and like that that change that people are going through whether it's puberty whether it's their attitudes and so forth and a lot of that affects kids on a day-to-day -day and they don't necessarily talk to their parents about that so but again me not being able to talk to teachers and walk through the classrooms and get to know other students or talk to other parents it really is a deficit and it creates a, a huge barrier with me being able to be an active parent on campus. And so for that, I really rely on the communication of the school to really keep me informed with what's going on when it's happening. Like I literally got a text message, no, a call today about DC score starting up today, today, <laughs> like it starts today. And so like now it's like a huge adjustment for them, for me, for everybody. And the communication is a huge piece. And like going back to the mental health supports and stuff, like communicating what's happening through the day. You know, I have to proactively reach out to teachers to ask them, how is my son behaving? How's my daughter behaving? How is things happening? Um, and so with all of that, it's just, it's a lot to try to engage when there's no opportunity for direct communication. Uh, but in terms of mental health supports, I think all of the things that I put in chat are huge for me, just being more proactive about the social emotional process that children mostly go through in school. And also just the the well being of the whole child through all of the things that they're going through in life, whether it's COVID, whether it's, you know, personal issues at home, whether it's 
academic excellence, whether it's, you know, transitioning from new schools to, you know, or from online to in class, like, there's just so many factors that I think um, it would be really great if there was more opportunities for parents and teachers and students to have like an open forum and communicate more about what's happening throughout the day. Hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. I think you brought up a lot of um, ways that kind of this transition from virtual where you have the access um, in a different way to now work in person, but don't have access fully in the ways that um, you once did once when you had access to the campus and stuff like that. Um, so thank you so much. That's really important um, in an area I think um, we could definitely expand upon. Um, so feel free to keep um, bringing things up. I see we're you know only a few minutes left, so I want to be sure that um, I can say thank you so much for all of your engagement and for participating. And if you ever have any other questions about the research that we do, um, or you want more information about this report, um, first the landing page is here. We have a one pager with a very concise version of the report in English and Spanish, as well as the full report um, and a recording of the panel event. Um, and then if you want to reach out to Chelsea or me, um, our email addresses are here and Jane also has that information. Um, yeah, Neela. Yeah, um, just one more point, and maybe it's not for exactly this work you're doing now, but for um, your organization more generally. I would like DCPS to have a plan for the next pandemic. I think there's going to be one. Um, and it was like there were so many missed opportunities here. You know, there was never really much exploration of outdoor education, how to do that safely. And if we find ourselves in another situation where it's not safe for children to be indoors, I don't think putting a five-year-old on Zoom for a year is, is a good solution. Um, and I would like to see other solutions going forward. Yeah, thank you so much. I think um, it's definitely something I've been keeping an eye on is like, you know, we, we did have to make this switch so quickly, like surely there's a way we can plan for this. Um, so I really appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I also see communication and transparency from Sherry. Thank you so much. Um, so important um, to know what's going on. Um, yeah, as well as um, bringing up testing, which I think, um, especially while students are feeling so um, vulnerable and having so much going on, it's gonna be really complicated. Um, yeah, and agree with planning for the future. Um, hopefully not <laughs> another pandemic, but you know, I have to do my like, uh, what my grandma always does. Like no more pandemics, but um, we should always be planning for what we'll need to do. Yeah, so thank you all so much. Um, if anyone has any last thoughts, feel free to share. Otherwise, I think, yeah, Jane, if you want to close us out, we really appreciate that um, you brought us in and we've been working together. We really can't say enough good things about um, all the help that PAVE has given us. Yeah, well, I just want to say thank you to Julie and Chelsea for hosting this coffee chat today. And also thank, to, thank you to all of you. This was for me watching. I couldn't keep my eye off the chat, but also um, everybody who was unmuting with all their great points, because it's hard to think back to last all the way last school year. But it's interesting to see the trends of what it looked like last school year versus this school year. So I just really appreciate one, everybody's attendance today, but also everyone's participation. Um, it was a really interesting conversation. But as you all know, it's not a PAVE event if we do not take a picture. Um, so Julie, if you don't mind, un um, stop sharing. Oh, yeah. We take a picture. And if you're all able, you guys all know the drill. I see everybody turning on their cameras. If you're able <laughs> um, to see everybody's faces, um, we can take a picture in a few seconds. Um, it's good to see everyone's faces. So I'm going to go ahead and take a picture in three, two, and one. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, again, there is another coffee chat on Friday at 12 p.m. about what's in, the mayor Bowser, what's in Mayor Bowser's budget. So we're just inundating you guys with all paved stuff, but a lot of things are happening. So I hope to see you guys there, and I hope you guys all have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. See you soon.
Thank you.